Did you start the camera by yourself? What do you have to say? That is a really close up shot of you. Can I do my part now? Hey, it's Tay with Mom on the Spectrum. Today I wanted to walk you step by step through the diagnostic process that I went through for my adult autism evaluation. Thank you for tuning into this channel. I've received a lot of great feedback, especially related to the videos about the diagnostic process. So I wanted to make another one of those because it seems like that has maybe been some helpful information. And I wanted to take you through my process and what it was like whenever I received my autism evaluation in 2020. I'm gonna do my best to share a screenshot of some of the tests that are available online. Some of the forms and the tests providers pay to use. And so I don't wanna share any copyrighted material. But I do know that, especially for those of us on the spectrum, it can really help to see things before we experience them. I want to give you as much information as I can. First of all, the most important step is finding a provider and I have a video about that. It's the video about finding a therapist, but it plays into the same steps that you're going to want to follow in order to find a diagnosing or evaluating psychologist for adult autism. So make sure you do that first. Finding the right psychologist is crucial. Also, I want to let you know every diagnostic process could look different. So depending on who your provider is, they might use a different battery of tests, they might use different methods, they might use different interview processes. So this is just my experience. I received my diagnosis and went through the evaluation process in 2020 in Texas. And I went through a psychologist, her name is Dr. Laura Sanders. She was in Texas, now she's in Colorado, but she's amazing. So if you happen to be in that area, you can check her out and I'll post her link in the description. So I'm just gonna share my diagnostic process what that looked like and just know that there can be great variations between the diagnostic process depending on where you get tested. So first off, I had a very extensive history form. Take any history form that you've filled out at the doctor's office and multiply it by 10. It was like every question I've ever been asked about my mental health history, physical health history, surgical history, childhood history, so many questions. I had to go back to my baby books. I had to text my mom. I was like, hey, do you know the answer to these questions? I can't remember. Anybody who's going to do an evaluation on you, you wanna make sure that they're taking into account not just what's currently happening in your life, but what has happened in the past because autism doesn't just suddenly show up. It's not something that develops. It's something that's present from an extremely young age. You wanna make sure that your psychologist is taking into account what you were like as a child. And if you don't have access to that information, I have read some people's stories who they just don't, they don't know the, the answers to that and their parents are deceased or they've lost contact, whatever it might be. You can still go off a fair amount of information and I don't want you to worry like if you don't have that information, it's not gonna completely screw up the process. It's just very helpful to take into account throughout the whole thing. I did that part online. I don't remember, I think it was 10 to 12 pages. It might've been 15 pages and I was very thorough in all of that. I wanted to make sure that I was really getting down to the nitty gritty. In addition to that, she also recommended a series of tests that I fill out on my own before coming to the evaluation in person. And I'm going to go through what those forms and tests are with you now. So number one, it was the AQ, which is the Adult Autism Spectrum Quotient. And that is available online and I will share it in the description with you. This is a series of 50 questions. The answers range from definitely agree to definitely disagree. So you just read the statement and then you select between definitely agree, slightly agree, slightly disagree, definitely disagree. And I have found it most helpful in those types of situations to just answer quickly. So don't overthink it because I know you might get in your head a little bit about it if you're like me, but just to go with your knee-jerk reaction and trust that that's a good answer. It's a very accessible test. It doesn't take too long and it shouldn't cause any tears or frustration. The second thing that I filled out was the Beck Anxiety Inventory. This I also found available online. This is a self-report measure of anxiety. There are 21 conditions listed like numbness or tingling, terrified or afraid, hands trembling, scared, indigestion, and you rate them from not at all present to severely present in your life. A lot of the evaluation and diagnostic process is leading out other possibilities, right? So you're not just testing for autism, you're testing for other things as well to make sure that it's not just something that's presenting as autism, but really is at the root, something different. Your psychologist will know all the ins and outs of what they need to test in order to finally arrive at an autism diagnosis, which should give you more peace of mind. Like you're not just testing for autism, you're also ruling out other conditions that might be present. And you might have more than one. I had more than one, surprise. The third test that I did before my actual in-person evaluation was the BDI-2. The BDI-2 is a 21 item self-report measure that explores major depression symptoms according to diagnostic criteria listed in the DSM. Diagnostics 
Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders. Beck Depression Inventory, that's what it stands for. These questions are going to represent the time period in the last two weeks in your life. So in the last two weeks, have you experienced this symptom? All of the time, none of the time. Again, it's a range of answers that you're going to choose from. This helps identify symptoms of depression if they're present. Okay, the next thing that I went through I think was really long if I'm remembering this correctly. I think it says here it's 344 questions. It is the PAI or the Personality Assessment Inventory. This is another big overview that helps rule out other conditions. So that's a, it's kind of a, an overview of different psychopathology. Psychopathology is the scientific study of mental disorders, so it's going to take a wide view of all of these different possibilities and kind of help narrow down the diagnosis. And lastly for me on this part of the process was the SRS2, and that is the social responsiveness scale. It identifies the presence and severity of social impairment within the autism spectrum and differentiates it from that which occurs in other disorders. So this one does zero in on autism. It helps identify different levels of autism in terms of social impairment impairment. After that section of tests and evaluations, I was asked to share two additional tests with a family member or relative who knew a lot about me so that they could also be a part of the conversation in the diagnostic process. It's also a really great way to kind of cross-evaluate to make sure that you're not just getting information from one person, but that you're comparing that information to somebody else who knows that person really well. I asked my husband to fill out these two forms. It was the SRS2, the one that I just described, but for a relative. The second thing that he was asked to fill out was the Pass O female, P A S O female. The Pass O is a personality assessment screener observer. So it works in conjunction with the PAI personality assessment inventory. You have a complimentary test for someone close to you to fill out that's going to cross evaluate the answers that you provided for the PAI. So those two work together. So all of that together, the comprehensive background information, plus the five tests that my psychologist recommended, plus the two tests that they recommended for my husband or another close friend or family member to complete. That was everything up until the in-person evaluation. At that point, I went to her office and she told me to prepare for a couple of hours together. I wasn't really given a lot of information about what to expect other than there would be an oral evaluation. So she was gonna ask me questions and I would be able to respond however it seemed appropriate based on my own experiences. And then after that, I was gonna go through some more testing. So it was gonna be IQ testing, cognitive testing, executive functioning, but I didn't exactly know what that was gonna look like. So that part, I remember being a little bit stressful for me and I was nervous because obviously it's like, I, want, I wanted to appear smart. I wanted my intelligence to test through, but I also wanted to get the autism diagnosis. I didn't know how those two things related or if they were gonna conflict. What I was mostly worried about was the social element of interacting with somebody that I've never interacted with before. But in hindsight, Dr. Sanders is great, very professional. The AC was broken that day and it was July in Texas so it was very hot and I was worried that that was going to skew my results because I was overheated and we had to wear masks because this was July right after the pandemic had started in 2020 so it was it was quite an experience but I survived so if I can do an autistic valuation in the heat of summer in Texas during a pandemic then you too can do it I think I remember bringing a water bottle and snacks definitely always have snacks with you right because they can get hangry meltdowns okay so I got there she was very kind a lot of the questions she asked me were similar to the questions I had already seen on the background information so she just wanted to hear in person how some things presented for me in childhood what my friendships looked like what I like to do for fun and for rest what my academic career was like so just kind of things that you that I could answer without really thinking about them. I didn't need to have any preparation to know these answers. It was just questions about my life and kind of how I saw the world. And then after that, we started this big like flip book of tests that just like kept coming and coming and coming. But these are called um, the KBIT2, K-B-I-T-2, and R bands, R B A N S test. The KBIT 2 test is the Kaufman Brief Intelligence Test. It's a brief IQ test, about 20 minutes. It says I don't honestly remember how long it took us. And there's three scores. So there's a verbal, nonverbal, and composite. And then I did the R bands test, repeatable battery for the assessment of neuropsychological status. <clears throat> this measures attention, language, visuospatial constructional abilities, and immediate and delayed memory. I remember in these tests, she would give me a list of things to remember and then she wouldn't ask me to repeat it until like 20 minutes later. There are also different patterns that she would show me and I would have to figure out which one didn't belong. And I believe on that test, it ranges from easy to like very difficult to where at the end I was like, 
like my brain would pick up on a pattern and I would know that there was one there but it was like by the end of this pattern section I was just like mentally exhausted on any section of this you can just say like pass or I don't know I'm like a completionist that's what my husband calls me like I don't really like video games but when I do play video games I have to like look under every single rock and go behind every corner. And that's kind of how I am generally in life. And so I, I felt like I needed to at least try every single question. So I probably took a lot longer on this than most people would. I do remember the pattern recognition being one of like the most frustrating things for me because I could almost see them and it just took me a really long time to figure it out. There's also math problems, spelling at the end of it, some really easy words and then just like a completely ludicrous word that there's no way you had heard before and you had to just sound out. Memorization, so there was like short-term memory and long-term memory. I would repeat a string of digits back to her. I remember I did really well on that one. She put her pencil down and she was like, how did you do that? And I was like, I don't, I don't know. And I just kind of sat there and she was like, no, I really, I would really like to know like how you did that. <laughs> and I don't know. I just, I just remembered it. So I remember, I think I did really well on that part. I think all in all, it might've taken me around two hours for everything in person. So that was like her interviewing me, the intelligence test, the R bands test, the whole flip folder thing. And then it was the opportunity for me to ask any questions that I had for her. The big thing that I want to make sure that I address, I really think is what helped me get the diagnosis. I got this tip from Laura Zdan, who has the Not Neurotypical podcast. She's great. I binged her podcast before I went through the process of evaluation and diagnosis myself. She has a lot of great information on what that process was like for her. But her suggestion was to write up everything that you can think of that would qualify you for an autism diagnosis. Even adult autism specialists today, the range of knowledge is so wide and varied. You really have to advocate for yourself in terms of why you feel like you fit a diagnosis. Hopefully you'll find a provider that really works with you to get you that diagnosis, but I ended up writing up 23 pages about why I felt like I qualified for the autism diagnosis. And I think that was one of the best things I did, not only for my provider, but for myself. Because when I started writing it all out, I mean, it was so cathartic because I had never done anything like that before, just really committed to this belief that I was autistic. And then my provider, Dr. Sanders, was like, oh my gosh, thank you so much for this write-up. It's so helpful, so thorough. My advice is to also do that for yourself and to give yourself some time. I originally sat down and was like, I'm going to write about why I qualify for this diagnosis. Hours later, I was like completely exhausted because I didn't know that it was going to take that long. My recommendation would be maybe to stick within the parameters of the core autism components. Social differences, communication differences, any repetitive behaviors that you have. I've spoken in other videos how my repetitive behaviors are not overt. Like other people don't notice I'm doing it. I click my teeth constantly. I was a band nerd, so I, I kind of got away with it, but I bang on everything. I tap my fingers on everything, twirling my hair. Mine have changed over the course of my life as well too. So they were different in childhood. I blink to spell words out all the time. So repetitive behavior is also restricted interests. Kind of the stereotypical examples like collecting trains. For me, I think maybe one of my restricted interests is psychology. I love studying it ad nauseum. To the detriment of those around me, they're probably like, you're not a psychologist, please stop. And video editing, you might find that you have an interest where you just start doing something in the whole world, like gets dark and you just have tunnel vision and you can do this thing forever. And that's how I am whenever I'm with technology. So overall, I am definitely glad that I went through this process. There's a lot of respect in the autism community for a self-diagnosis, especially because it can be kind of tricky to find a provider to support you, especially if you're a female who's seeking a diagnosis later in life. But for me, and especially for my husband, the official diagnosis from a psychologist was so cathartic and so healing. It helped us with a lot of communication and social differences that we have had in our marriage. And we've been married a long time. He was my high school sweetheart, and we've been married almost 11 years. So it was really, really helpful for our relationship to have something on paper that really explained what was going on and why. And it wasn't just in our heads. It was something that we could both learn coping techniques and skills to kind of manage and find more vitality and enjoyment together. And speaking of something on paper, after my whole evaluation process, I would say it's always longer than you want it to be. I can't remember how many weeks it was, but she got it back to me pretty quickly. I think it was like two or three weeks and I had a very long write-up of everything that had happened, which is so helpful. So I think it was like 20 pages that was written up about how I had done on the test, what her interpretation was of the results. And then at the bottom, it was like the official diagnosis and it was autism spectrum disorder level one. I think it said without intellectual impairment. I believe that there's three different levels of autism and that I'll have 
have to research that and do another video on that later. I guess level one is what, what a lot of people would call high functioning, which I'm not a fan of that term, but you've probably heard that thrown around. So my official diagnosis was autism spectrum disorder level one. I also had some other goodies on my list of diagnoses that I'll share another time, but that was one of the really cool things about this evaluation is it put things in perspective for me and kind of categorized where the symptoms that I had were kind of falling in and making sense. And that just, it meant so much to be able to see that on paper and it meant so much for my husband and my friends to be able to see that on paper. I also have some other videos about what it's like to share your diagnosis, which I would only recommend doing after you have yourself become comfortable with it and have the words to know how to communicate it. And then as you become ready, you can share it with whoever you deem is a safe person who's going to respect and validate your experiences. We all have unique brains, whatever label you want to put on it. It's given me so much more grace and compassion for not just myself, but for everyone around me. You don't need a test to know that your brain is unique. And I think that this whole process has just taught me that we all deserve a lot more patience and respect. We're all going through our own unique challenges. So I just want to encourage you wherever you're at at this step in the process, be present. It's easy to wish that you were a little bit further down the line, but there's so much to get out of where you are right now. My husband actually shared this with me today. I think it'd be a good thing to end on. Try to love the questions themselves as if they were locked rooms or books written in a very foreign language. Don't search for the answers which could not be given to you now because you would not be able to live them. And the point is to live everything. Live the questions now. Perhaps then, someday far in the future, you will gradually, without even noticing it, live your way into the answer. Keep being weird, own your neurodiversity, and I'd love to hear from you in the comments about where you're at in the process. If you're on your way to an evaluation or trying to decide if you should get one, make sure that you click the subscribe button, which may or may not be right here. That's the easiest way to support me so that I can keep creating free content for you, and I'll see y'all in the next video. Thanks for watching. Bye.